Anh đừng, anh đừng có rung nữa, anh đừng có rung nữa lấy máy rồi câu bây giờ từ nó thấy ra nhiều điểm không không nhiều lắm bao nhiêu mà không nhiều lắm năm hai chụp năm hai mà không nhiều lắm chừng nó đổ hành đuối à <cười> chừng nó đổ rác hết làm sao mà chị rửa cái mặt nó lắng o à, không biết cái chị bay cái thằng bay gì tối ra rồi không nhìn thì thấy cái mặt ông tối thui á xíu nữa là mình nghỉ ngơi rồi nha Đó xíu nữa Trắng đỡ tập trung ừ. Thấy chồng này tao làm sao vậy làm gì cho chơi ghê Thử nhìn cái khúc cái tầm nhìn của mình, mình. Ừ. Những toàn không biết sợ Cái thằng mập mập mà nhớ cái cái ngày mà ta đi chơi bên khách sạn nữa không? Ừ. Trời ơi, đứng đỡ dễ sợ luôn Hết rồi, hết rồi Hết rồi, hết rồi Tội ổng kêu hút máu thăm mà dọn ở nhà, không có tiền cho nó đi làm kìa Mà đỡ, ổng kêu hút máu thăm á Mà nhờ nó cho mình nhà, không có tiền cho nó đi làm á Ừ. chịu khó đúng rồi đã chịu khó đó mà mình do mình làm một tỷ thành ra là mình hút mình nặng luôn có mấy cái bầm nó giá luôn cái thằng đó nhanh đỡ dễ sợ luôn đi mỗi lần đi xuống làm chở thêm nhỏ em xuống ngồi chờ Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ những video hấp dẫn
Rồi dạ bị tắt cái máy này nữa mới <cười> có cái bào cho cho anh mấy cái cái, cái cục đó chưa kiến gì vậy? Ừ. tự nhiên nó hiện có bào rồi cái ngăn nha ngăn ở đây ngăn phải hiểu ngôn ngôn từ ở đây rồi sắp xong rồi hai cục nữa là xong rồi mình lại cho nghỉ ngơi nha được nhưng mà không báo thôi. Ừ, báo một quần áo đi. Đấy cái mũ nhìn to dễ sợ thì. để im đó để cái để im đó chị để để đi tìm chịu khó chút bé nghe chịu khó chị làm trang kỹ nghe chị xí điều hòa nha dạ từ bay ngay indulge your supernatural fantasies with this big chevy hardtop done up as a clone of the hero car from the tv series which is now up for auction on the bring a trailer website With bench seating, 
a two-speed Powerglide transmission, and a burbling 283 cubic inch engine, this is an ideal weekend cruiser that makes all the right sounds. Repainted black and fitted with chrome 15-inch five-spoke wheels, this Impala will be instantly familiar to a demographic far younger than your usual muscle car enthusiast. Running over 15 seasons since it debuted in 2005, Supernatural was one of the longest-running, most successful fantasy TV series ever. Focusing on fictional twin brothers Sam and Dean Winchester as they roved around the country fighting demons and ghosts, it was sort of a cross between a traditional western and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And in a western, you need a faithful horse. Dean Winchester had Baby, his beloved Impala. Originally, the show was supposed to feature the more obvious choice of a mid-1960s Ford Mustang, but the decision was made to go for something a little rougher around the edges. A black pillarless hardtop Impala offered the necessary air of menace, low and rumbling and with the implication that there was plenty of space in the trunk for a body or two. Up for auction on the website Bring a Trailer, which, like Car and Driver, is part of Hearst Autos, is a clone with all the charm of the supernatural hero car. With the auction set to end on Tuesday, December 6, bidding sits at just $5,200. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. 2023 Mini Cooper Southeast First Drive, a sign of great things to come. Lively handling and expressive design have been Mini's hallmarks ever since BMW reinvigorated the mark for the 21st century, so it stands to reason that a brand like Mini could benefit massively from the onrushing electrification of the automobile. But so far, outfitting Mini's lineup of compact and subcompact models with motors and batteries has been slow going at best. To see how Mini has been coming along on its path to the inevitable future of automaking, we jumped behind the wheel of its only all-electric powered offering at present, the recently updated 2023 Mini Cooper SE, for a quick spin. What's changed since we last drove an SE? In case you missed our initial coverage, the Mini Cooper SE isn't just an electrified version of the base Mini hardtop coupe. Mini actually started with the hotter Cooper S trim when building its SEV. Although it no doubt would have been better to start from a dedicated electric platform, we appreciate that Mini set out to lend some sportiness to its first ever mainstream consumer EV. When we first tested the 2020 Cooper SE, we enjoyed its entertaining driving dynamics and model-specific styling cues, but we also found it to be lacking in other areas. Mini attempted to make the Cooper SE a bit more appealing with a refresh for 2022 that included new technology, cosmetic changes, and most important an improved EPA-rated range of 114 miles. Although the SE received the same exterior facelift as the rest of the Mini lineup, which makes it look less distinctive and more like the regular hardtop, SE badging and the addition of an optional tricolor gradient roof help set it apart slightly from its gas-powered siblings. Mini also reworked the hardtop's interior with a reshaped dash and modified air vents a standard digital instrument cluster, and a standard 8.8-inch infotainment display. And for the 2023 model, Mini added more paint and upholstery options, standard Apple CarPlay, and a new special Resolute Edition. The good. The Mini Cooper SE's new face is kinda cute, sort of like a Pokemon you can drive and it's only available in a two-door body steel, a positive to us in a world where the number of true coupes is drastically shrinking. The roof gradient effect is also very cool in real life, and Mini even affixes a small roof spoiler that enhances the sporty look. The inside is as distinctive as the exterior but remains fairly ergonomic despite the quirky design. As with the gasoline models, the SE's power switch is a tab that's laid out within a row of switchgear, adding a little bit of fighter pilot fun to starting up the car. Mini also equips the SE with a conventional shift knob, a reminder that this is a transitional vehicle between the existing line of hardtop variants and what Mini says will be a dedicated EV platform in the future. Rather than positioning the regenerative braking mode selector as a click down from drive, Mini places the selector switch amid the rest of the car's hard controls on the center stack. Drivers can select between the standard mid-setting, 
the more responsive sport mode, the frugal green mode, and the super conservative green plus mode. As one would expect, sport mode is by far the best way to have fun in the Cooper SE. A single motor drives the front wheels, spinning out 181 horsepower and 199 lbft of torque. In our testing the Cooper SE hit 60 miles per hour from a standstill in just 6.0 seconds, making it quicker than the 6.6 second run managed by the 2022 Cooper S sidewalk convertible we tested. Like one would expect from a traditional front drive hot hatch, mashing the throttle yields some torque steer but it's easy to overcome and gives the Cooper SE a feisty character. While flinging the electric mini hatchback along some country roads, we found it to be lively and tossable. Its steering is heavy and somewhat numb, but it's accurate enough and allowed us to explore the limits of the Cooper SE's communicative chassis. The default regenerative braking setting is aggressive but highly predictable and easy to get used to. We briefly sampled the less forceful Regan setting but found it provided too little bite and required us to fuss with using the actual brake pedal. The Mini Cooper SE has all of the benefits of a small car, and its clever battery packaging allows it to swallow the same amount of cargo as a regular Mini hardtop. Navigating traffic, engaging in a spirited drive, and parking are all strong suits of the electrified hatchback. In this regard, it looks like Mini has everything going for it when it does move over to building electric vehicles from the ground up. On the safety front, Mini offers a satisfactory suite of standard active safety equipment for the SE, including front collision warnings, automatic emergency braking, and lane departure warnings. Ticking the box for the driver assistance package adds adaptive cruise control, a head-up display, and a parallel parking assistant. Safety scores for the 2022 Mini Hardtop were fairly strong, with good scores in every crashworthiness category from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. The bad. On balance, the Cooper SE is a solid car, and we'd be lying if we said we didn't have fun hurtling it up a mountain road. That said, there were a couple of disappointing drawbacks that held it back from maximum enjoyment. The first is obvious, only 114 miles of maximum range. When we jumped in our SE test car at the staging area of the BMW Test Fest event, it showed 55% charge when we took off. A subsequent hill climb sapped a load of electrons from the SE's small 32.6 kWh battery. Even though the route was short, the range anxiety was real as we watched the available miles tumble in real time. In the 16.7 miles we drove from our starting point to the turnaround spot, the battery dropped to 25% charge, with about 20 miles of remaining range indicated. Not sure if the descent would actually add enough range to get us back to the staging area, we fired up green plus mode and carefully headed back down the mountain, attempting to recoup as much range as possible. The drive back didn't actually net us any more battery life but we ended up with the same indicated remaining range and state of charge as we had at the highest point of our drive, a minor victory for the Mini. The second frustrating thing we experienced was that the car cuts power when charging hard at full throttle in some applications. This impinges on its hot hatch character, making it hard to rely on for the sporty performance that it otherwise delivers so well. Finally, the Cooper SE rides fairly stiff and allows in a decent amount of road noise, so buyers who live in areas with a lot of poor roads should be wary. And although we appreciate that CarPlay is now standard, the 8.8-inch infotainment display feels pretty small, partly because of its location within the giant ring that Mini still slaps in the center of the dash. To heighten the Cooper SE's appeal, it would behoove Mini to also include Android Auto in the future. These deficiencies make it hard to recommend the Cooper SE, as it is to most folks that need something for anything more than city commuting. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. BMW expands into hydrogen power with fuel cell SUV based on the X5. The BMW 95 hydrogen fuel cell SUV is now entering low volume production and will begin testing in select regions next spring. Based on the regular BMW X5, the 9.5 is retrofitted with a fuel cell stack, an electric motor and battery, 
and a new floor to fit its hydrogen tanks. BMW believes both electric and hydrogen-powered vehicles are necessary to combat climate change, with the 9.5 a potential precursor to future models. Along with a growing number of automakers, BMW says it's committed to combating global climate change and aims to be carbon neutral by 2050. Unlike many automakers, however, the German brand believes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles will play a big role in reaching that goal, alongside battery electric vehicles, of course. Leading the charge is the hydrogen-powered BMW 95 SUV that has just begun low-volume production. It was first previewed a few years ago by the iHydrogen Next concept that appeared at the 2019 Frankfurt Auto Show. Starting sometime next spring, 2023, the small batch of 9.5S that BMW is now building will hit the streets in select regions around the world for testing purposes. Based on the regular BMW X5, which is built in the company's factory in Spartansburg, South Carolina, the 9.5 is assembled at BMW's Research and Innovation Center in Munich, Germany. The transformation from X5 to 9.5 includes swapping in an entirely new floor to fit the fuel cell system's two hydrogen tanks that are located under the midsize SUV's central tunnel and rear seats. The tanks have a total capacity of about 16 pounds and feed an underhood fuel cell stack paired with a rear-mounted electric motor and battery. BMW says the 9.5's entire fuel cell electric system makes a combined 374 horsepower. The company also says its curb weight is comparable to the plug-in hybrid X5, which weighed 5,627 pounds on our scales. BMW claims the 9.5 can accelerate from 0 to 62 miles per hour in under 7 seconds and has a top speed of 118 miles per hour. It also has an estimated driving range of around 310 miles although that claim is based on the optimistic European WLTP cycle. BMW believes that fuel cell powertrains will provide a carbon-free alternative to customers with needs that can't be met by EVs, such as those who need to refuel quickly and don't have fast charging access. The company also thinks hydrogen power will help offset the challenges that electrification faces, especially with medium and heavy-duty trucks. Other issues the technology is said to address include regions with constraints on electrical grid capacity and renewable resources. Plus, BMW says more than 40 countries worldwide currently have a strategy regarding hydrogen power and cites the continuous buildup of hydrogen refueling stations since 2020. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. Custom Resta Mod 1965 Dodge D200 Wedges in a Modern Laramie Interior. Classic on the outside, modern on the inside. Fooled again. Never saw it coming until you open the truck door. The idea of slipping a classic body over a modern drivetrain isn't new, but it never gets old. The example here mates a first generation, 1961 to 1965. Dodge D200 body with a brand new, it's all relative, four-wheel drive 2010 Ram 2500 Laramie pickup truck, resulting in nostalgic D200 vibes underpinned by modern technology and amenities. It's the best of all worlds, except for all the work involved and essentially devouring two different trucks. Let's just say, if it landed in the driveway, we wouldn't kick it out. Since this Dodge D200 is a 2010 Ram 2500 at heart, it's powered by a 6.7-liter Cummins i6 backed by a rebuilt Jasper 68 RFE automatic transmission. A 1965 with a Cummins would have predated the first prototype Cummins-powered Dodge truck by 20 years, and a factory Cummins-powered Dodge truck wouldn't roam city streets until four years later in 1989. And obviously it wasn't the same Cummins as this 6.7 liter, which was cleaned, inspected, resealed, and painted Cummins beige. The 2010 Ram HD's Cummins, rated at 350 horsepower and 650 lbft of torque, would be quite a surprise upon popping the hood of the D200. The outside of this Oxford Grey Dodge D-Series looks smooth and straight, showing off the beautiful lines of that classic swept line bed, 
which was cut down and modified to fit its new chassis. Likewise, the front fenders were extended, while a taller intercooler and radiator necessitated a 500 series truck grille filler panel for proper clearance. The modified and rechromed 1965 bumper has chrome tow hooks. The side mirrors, door handles, rear bumper, and tailgate tout modern functionality despite their old fashioned looks. The vintage looking stainless power mirrors are compatible with the factory Laramie controls, and the polished original stainless refrigerator door handles were modified to work with the 2010 door latches, retaining power locks and door switches. The rear bumper houses factory 2010 backup sensors, and an aftermarket backup camera hides in the tailgate. Lastly, a flip-down license plate covers the hitch receiver. A 3-inch lift, suspended by Rancho shocks, looks correct atop 37 by 13.50 BF Goodrich KM3 mud terrain tires. The white-black Rhino armory wheels are highlighted by 96 polished stainless flange head bolts. Custom clips mount the polished OEM vintage Mopar hubcaps. Side note, we feel back for whoever's responsible for keeping these wheels clean. RBP power steps with LED lighting help passengers get in and out, and German Hella headlights and fog lights help light the road, as do LED taillights. While the outside looks like a 1965 Dodge D200, the inside does not, at all. From dashboard to front seats to all the wiring and modules, the brown interior is mostly 2010 Ram Laramie. That mean dual-zone climate control, Laramie power heated and cooled front seats, heated steering wheel, and so on. That also means the factory-installed trailer brake controller, exhaust brake, and TPMS and ABS systems all work. Not bad for a 65. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. Tesla Model 3 Highland update coming soon, according to insiders. Despite its continued popularity, the fact remains that the Tesla Model 3 EV sedan is getting a bit long in the tooth. The EV landscape is very different compared to when the Model 3 was first introduced, and the automaker faces real market threats from competitors like 2023 Hyundai Ioniq 5 which won our SUV of the Year award, and more directly from the upcoming Ionic 6 sedan. So a new report from Reuters with insider details about a potential upcoming refresh are not surprising. Rumors have swirled for quite a while that Tesla has been working on an update to the Model 3 codenamed Highland, but thus far Tesla has not confirmed them. Despite that, for individuals with knowledge of the Highland project told Reuters that Tesla is getting ready to put the updated Mode 3 into production, and that it will feature new styling and other updates. However, it won't be merely a cosmetic refresh. Tesla is taking a hard look at the Model 3's underpinnings to find ways to simplify production and use fewer interior components all in an effort to reduce cost. Despite recent reports that Tesla earns more profit per vehicle than Toyota, Tesla's stock has dropped by approximately 41% between September 2022 and November 2022. So, it's no surprise that the automaker is looking for ways to save money, especially on a high-volume car like the Model 3. Two of the four unidentified sources claim that the updated Tesla Model 3 will be manufactured at the automaker's Shanghai and Fremont factories with production in Shanghai starting in the third quarter of 2023. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. The Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat's manual transmission is back after a brief vacation. Well, it looks like the Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat's manual option, after having been removed from Dodge's site earlier in 2022, is back in the lineup for 2023. The six-speed Tremec manual is listed as the standard transmission for the non-Red Eye Challenger SRT Hellcat in official documents. But where did the Tremec go, and why? Don't blame the lack of popularity of manuals in most new car sales. Dodge's reasoning is a bit more digital than that. The powertrain control module, PCM, fitted to manual-equipped Challengers required a new calibration, putting any chance of getting a stick on the model on ice for the rest of the 2022 model year. A forum post, via road and track, dating back to December 10th, 
2021 shows that the manual transmission version of the Challenger Hellcat was not available for 22. However, looking on Dodge's website at the time, every other manual option of the Challenger could be ordered, but the Hellcat manual isn't even on the site. That same forum post also alleged that getting the manual transmission paired with the Hellcat's 6.2-liter supercharged Hemi V8 to pass emissions is the issue, which could imply this is the required recalibration Dodge mentioned. There might be some grain of truth to that, but we weren't able to directly confirm. When we did ask if there was a calibration issue with the Challenger Hellcat, Dodge acknowledged there was, but added that updating calibrations are a normal part of vehicle production and that this isn't related to the issues with silicon-based chip and PCM supply shortages currently disrupting the industry. Setting up this new calibration ultimately required, well, a single model year. After initially saying it was unsure of when the updated programming would be ready and the Challenger Hellcat would return to availability, Dodge quietly added it to its 2023 Challenger specifications documents. That means now, anyone interested in a manual Challenger Hellcat, and why wouldn't you be, needn't pick something else or go with the automatic if they have their heart set on a supercharged 6.2-liter V8. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. Toyota confirms Grand Highlander SUV with hybrid max powertrain. Toyota confirmed the existence of the new Grand Highlander SUV, which it plans to fully reveal at the Chicago Auto Show on February 8. The three-row SUV will likely fill the gap between the mid-size three-row Highlander and the larger, body-on-frame full-size Sequoia. Notably, the Grand Highlander is wearing the same hybrid max badge as the top-spec Crown Sedan which suggests a 340-horsepower setup. It looks like Toyota wants to join in on the excitement surrounding enlarged versions of SUVs like the Grand Cherokee L and Grand Wagoneer L by making its own supersized version of the Highlander called, you guessed it, the Grand Highlander. While the current Highlander boasts impressive fuel economy in hybrid form, it can't compete with the third-row space of competitors including the Kia Telluride, Volkswagen Atlas, and Chevy Traverse. Toyota describes the Grand Highlander as the ultimate road trip vehicle, implying increased legroom and cargo space. The first teaser shot of the new three-row SUV gives us a glimpse at what the rear will look like. We're particularly excited about the Hybrid Max batch, which indicates the Grand Highlander Platinum will receive the same potent powertrain as the top-spec Crown Sedan. In that car, the hybrid setup with a turbocharged 2.4-liter inline-four gas engine produces a combined 340 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. Toyota didn't give any information about the Grand Highlander's available powertrains, but it's likely the standard 265-horsepower turbo four from the base Highlander will carry over to this new model as well. We managed to pull back some of the shadows layered over the photo to expose a bit more of the car. The increased visibility shows similar squared-off styling to the current Highlander, but also includes a pair of round exhaust tips not found on the standard version. The taillights take on a C-shape, and a new light bar spans the spoiler. We don't have any other info on pricing or when we'll actually start seeing the Grand Highlander on the road but we do know that Toyota is planning to do a full reveal of the SUV at the Chicago Auto Show on February 8. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. The Toyota Land Cruiser will likely return to U.S. The globally iconic Toyota Land Cruiser off-road SUV is the automaker's longest-running model, since 1951, just no longer in the U.S. as of last year, for whatever reason. There's now a new global Land Cruiser, the J300 series, and we still get the Lexus LX Luxury SUV that's based on that global model here. However, our options may be expanding beyond Lexus once again in a few years' time, according to Jack Hollis, Executive Vice President of Sales for Toyota Motor North America. In an interview with Motor Trend following news of the all-new 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander three-row SUV, Hollis was asked if a storied nameplate like the Land Cruiser would ever make its return stateside, and the answer was promising, will we ever? I would say likely yes, asked if it would be in the foreseeable future, he said we would have to wait for an answer on that one.
Obviously Land Cruiser is such an important part of our heritage and has done such a great job. And I'll be looking at it, absolutely. Have I seen designs, thoughts, and hopes, yes. But nothing to announce. It's still a ways off, Hollis added. So it's certainly not confirmed, but it's a much stronger answer than we were expecting. Then again, even last year's Land Cruiser departure announcement came with a wink, with Toyota encouraging loyal enthusiasts and intrepid adventurers to stay tuned for future developments. The current global Land Cruiser is built on the new body on frame GAF framework based on its TNGA platform, which our current Lexus LX is also built from. Focusing on the US market, the new fourth generation LX SUV got a significant update recently. Its 3.4-liter twin-turbo V6 engine bumped output up 28 horsepower and 78 lb-ft of torque, now totaling 409 horsepower and 479 lb-ft, and it's linked to a 10-speed automatic transmission. Toyota says the new platform lowered the center of gravity with improved weight distribution. The global Land Cruiser also shed 441 pounds of weight. However, it sounds like we should be looking beyond the current J300 series Land Cruiser to whatever the next generation model may look like, which will almost certainly need to be electrified, either hybrid or full battery electric. Toyota's EV plans are reportedly in flux with the automaker devoting more resources to expedite its EV offerings, though no specific models have been teased, and the existing EV concepts may no longer be on the cards. Still, Hollis' comment is a promising start to whatever's next, and it sounds like still they have some confident ideas for the next Land Cruiser, at the very least. Welcome to NNC Car Reviews Channel. What is a 1970 AR Cuda, and why do I want one in my driveway? Time to kick down that annoying fourth wall and go a little first person, recently we were working on some Mecham auction stuff and I was asked by another editor what car I would want under my proverbial Christmas tree. Now, I used to run Super Chevy, and although my car choices would lead people to believe that I'm a diehard Chevy guy, the truth is that I like cars in general, even if I do get pulled into the Chevy gravity well most of the time. After browsing the Kissimmee, Florida, Mecham listings, I found the car I would want, a 1970 AAR Plymouth Barracuda. A Mopar! Yeah, but not just any Mopar. How many E-bodies were built in 1970? Before we look specifically at the AAR variant, we should get an idea about how special the 1970 Mopar lineup was. Many consider 1970 to be the high watermark for E-bodies, and in terms of sales, it certainly was. Chrysler was hoping to sell nearly a quarter million E-bodies that year, and although it didn't hit that number, the company did sell a ton of cars, with 55,499 Barracudas and 83,032 Challengers leaving the factory. The Plymouth Barracuda, shortened to Cuda by the cool kids, like the Challenger, offered three lines, as well as three body styles, the base coupe, a hardtop, and a convertible. A whopping nine engine options were on the menu, ranging from the base 145 horsepower Slant 6 to the iconic 455 horsepower 426 Hemi V8. What is an AAR Cuda? Anyone who knows me would tell you that I'm into the whole pro touring deal, so that might be why the AAR Cuda flips my switches. The AAR Cuda joined the Plymouth family in March of 1970 and was a tribute to Dan Gurney's All-American Racers, AAR, Barracudas being run in the SCCA Trans AM series. The track version the team fielded was powered by a 440-horsepower 305-inch V8 topped with a lone four-barrel carb. The civilian AAR Cuda was built to approve, homologate, in fancy talk, the small block engine for SCCA racing use. Only 2,724 AAR Cudas were built in 1970 at the Hamtramck, Michigan, plant. The AAR was only produced for one year, making it a fairly rare piece of automotive and racing history. What engine was in the AAR Cuda? 
the street version of the AA Arcuda got a 340-inch, 4.04-inch bore slash 3.31-inch stroke, iron block V8 with iron heads, solid lifters, and three two-barrel holly carburetors sitting on an Edelbrock aluminum intake. The 346 barrel was rated at 290 horsepower at 5,000 RPM and 350 lbft of torque at 2,800. Not the most powerful offering, but no slouch either. What else made the AA Arcuda different? Though the interior was fairly standard, the exterior was anything but. It was offered in many of the high-impact colors of the day, and given a racy look with a functional matte black fresh air fiberglass hood and distinctive strobe stripes that incorporated the tricolor AAR Shield logo. The trunk lid received a unique black ducktail spoiler, and the rear of the Cuda was raised nearly two inches to allow for the side exit exhaust. Related, 1970 Cuda returned to the track after 30 years in storage. The AAR had special stocks and rolled on Goodyear Polyglas GT 60 15-inch tires in the rear and E60 15-inch tires in the front. This gave the 1970 AAR Cuda the distinction of being the first Detroit production car with staggered wheel sizes. 1,120 were equipped with the A833 4-speed manual trans and 1,603 had the 3-speed A727 torque flight automatic. You know which one we prefer. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Polestar 2 BST Edition 270 Echoes Polestar's Past Before Polestar became Volvo's all-electric offshoot brand, it was the Swedish carmaker's racing and performance division. Perhaps in a bid to regain some of that sporty personality, there's a new limited production model, the 2023 Polestar 2 BST Edition 270. With the dual-motor Polestar 2 as a starting point, the 270 in the name refers to the worldwide production run. The BST is a nod to its internal beast development code. For the $76,900 starting price, the BST is essentially a Polestar 2 with the optional pilot, plus, and performance pack options. According to Polestar's online configurator, Adding these options to a non-BST model takes the price to $66,400. The BST's power output of 469 horsepower and 502 pound-feet of torque is the same as the performance packs, as are the upgraded Brembo brakes. The EV guts are also carryovers, with a lithium-ion battery pack that has a 75.0 kWh usable capacity and DC fast charging up to a 155 kW rate. Range drops slightly though, from an EPA-estimated 260 miles down to 247 miles. The BST's price premium is justified with exclusive add-ons that include 21-inch forged wheels with bespoke Pirelli P0s, a front strut bar, a 1-inch lower ride height, painted body cladding, and black mirrors. The big news is the inclusion of special Alene's dampers that are two-way adjustable up front. To see if those upgrades paid off, we had the opportunity to ring out the BST on the Bay Area Skyline Boulevard, an abstract scribble of pavement famed for slicing through the redwoods. Within the first few blocks heading out of Burlingame, California, it's clear the BST's ride quality is firmer than the standard Polestar 2 with the performance pack. You definitely feel the impacts from ruts in the pavement, but only large potholes cause any real harshness. The smaller bumps are adequately smoothed over thanks in large part to the Olean's damper's dual-flow valving that allows for distinct behaviors for low- and high-speed compression events. It's similar to how progressive springs can add some initial compliance for comfort and stability while also having greater resistance when cornering hard. The difference is that the Olean's dampers are more easily adjustable to suit your tastes. The coilover spring preloads are also manually adjustable with the right tools. Polestar's Christian Samson, head of product attributes, informed us that our BST was set to 7 on the adjustment scale of 1 to 22 with 1 being the firmest and 22 the softest. That potentially leaves a lot more compliance for everyday comfort and a bit more firmness for a track day, 
though the 127 miles per hour top speed will limit how much fun you can have on the straightaways. As we find our way to Skyline Boulevard, the suspension begins to shine. You feel a strong connection to the BST and the Pirelli's contact patches with every nudge of the steering wheel, though the steering effort seems too light for spirited driving. In typical EV fashion, having the batteries below the floor masks a lot of the small hatchback seats slash the estimated 4,700 pound curb weight. It's easy to get acclimated to the BST's handling characteristics, and in no time we're pushing harder and harder into each consecutive turn. Larger undulations in the road can cause some alarming hops, though. The Polestar BST is as entertaining and lively as the BMW i4, and the lack of synthetic motor noises gives it a more zen-like experience. You hear the tires squeal in turns and whimper when you're hard on the brakes. They give a very good indication of how much harder you can drive in a delightfully old-school analog manner. We executed a very subtle four-wheel slide in one bend and were pleased with how intuitive and effortless it was to manage. There weren't any snap releases from adhesion, nor was there any need for any rally car histrionics by sawing away at the wheel. Like a gold medal gymnast, it just stuck the landing. Point, the BST was also well-mannered on slick roads. Mid-corner bumps were barely acknowledged and there was still an abundance of grip to keep charging with more aggression than most drivers would consider sensible. There's no doubt that the BST is a very different beast compared to the Polestar 2. It's a hardcore version for the few who are willing to sacrifice some comfort for cornering excellence. It's as good a dance partner as the i4, and its interior is noticeably nicer than that of a Tesla Model 3. With most EVs taking the SUV route, there are few sporty alternatives that don't cost as much as a Porsche Taycan or an Audi e-tron GT. Unfortunately, if you're interested in a new Polestar 2 BST, you're out of luck as all of the 270 examples have been spoken for. And that begs the question of why Polestar greenlights such a limited production run. It seems likely that the BST is testing the waters for a more serious performance EV in the future. If that ends up being realized, we'll be pacing with nervous anticipation. It's impressive that the BST is able to extract so much more handling prowess from the existing Polestar 2, and bodes well for a purpose-built performance model. The in-design Porsche 911 Restomod is no backup singer. We must wait for the day when automotive artisans reimagine third-gen Camaros or Fox-bodied Mustangs into immaculate carbon fiber-bodied restomods that command six-figure prices. Until then, we'll have to keep slumming with the 964 generation of the Porsche 911. Of course, there are plenty of reasons why the penultimate air-cooled 911 is the frequent muse for high-end tuning outfits. There is no shortage of cars to start with. Porsche having sold more than 60,000 of all variants globally between 1989 and 1994. Interest, and values, are also high enough to find a market for expensive transformations. The most famous recreator of the 964 is undoubtedly Singer in California, which has been producing versions that cross the boundary from car to automotive art for more than a decade. But an increasing number of other shops are now getting into the same space. Last year, we told you about an EV version produced by Everetai in the UK, although we struggled to see what the electric powertrain added to the experience. Now here's another British firm, but this one sticks with internal combustion. The small shop is called Theon Design, and it gave C slash D the chance to experience a partially carbon fiber bodied 964 just before it was shipped to a buyer in Chile, hence the car's Chi 001 name. Oh, and that customer is a successful blueberry farmer, if you're wondering about the reason for its violently violet color scheme. As with many similar businesses, Theon Design was born from a personal passion, in this case, the quest of a man named Adam Hawley to build his own perfect 964 while working 9 to 5 as a car designer for big auto companies including Jaguar Land Rover. The car was eventually finished to a standard that had friends and acquaintances asking him to create something similar for them, 
leading to the establishment of Theon Design with business partner Lucinda Argy, who is also his wife. While the Theon Chi 001 shares its basic form with the 964, its detailing is clearly inspired by that of earlier 911s. It has lost the full-width rear light bar it was built with and gained both 930 turbo-style bumper overriders and headlamp bezels. The original car underneath the conversion was a Carrera for sold in Japan, but it has been stripped to component parts and completely rebuilt. Structural changes include a carbon fiber roof, trunk lid, engine cover, and spoiler. The fenders and bumpers are made from a sturdier carbon Kevlar blend. Weight saving over a regular 964 is around 220 pounds, according to Holly, with the part composite bodywork also making the car stronger. Up close, the attention to detail is close to obsessive, including touches such as the symmetric mounting of the twin ignition coils on the engine firewall and the invisible integration of a center, high-mounted brake light into the rear window surround. Theon's customers have a choice of powertrains, including the intriguing option of a supercharger conversion the company has developed for the air-cooled flat six. The Qi 001 is running a naturally aspirated 4.0-liter engine, individual throttle bodies and careful internal balancing take peak output to 400 horsepower at 7,100 rpm. It has also lost its original all-wheel drive system, and power is now sent exclusively to the rear axle through a 6-speed 993-generation gearbox and a limited-slip differential. Not every part of the experience has been updated. Getting in, we find the familiar, slightly offset driving position, and although beautifully ret-rimmed in a vibrant hue to match the exterior paint, the cabin's basic architecture is unchanged. But starting the engine reveals an immediately different character to a regular Carrera of this generation. First, the bark of the exhaust, which switchable acoustic flaps vary from loud to very loud. Second is the immediacy of the engine's responses to even slight accelerator pedal pressure, thanks to an ultralight flywheel. Comparing Theon's car with a regular 964 is made complicated by the increasingly distant memories of what the original car was like when new, but this one drives with a level of poise and precision it seems hard to imagine that any stock 964 possessed even when factory fresh, with the possible exception of the famous RS variant. The Qi 001 steering feels direct and slack-free for an air-cooled 911. It retains hydraulic assistance, but this is now powered by an electric pump. Revised suspension geometry, stiffer bushings, and active dampers increase the precision with which the front end can be placed, although they also mean there is less sense of the 964's fundamental rear-biased weight distribution in corners. Easing the accelerator with the chassis loaded up tightens the line progressively but not snappily. The biggest dynamic difference is probably down to the modern Michelin Pilot Sport PS2S mounted on the period Fuchs style rims, which give an abundance of grip. The ride is firm even with the adaptive dampers in their softest setting, but not uncomfortably so. Yet the engine is the Qi 001 starring feature, impressively muscular low down but with what feels like an inexhaustible appetite for revs that the scalpel sharp accelerator encourages a driver to exploit. The tachometer only goes to 8000 rpm, but the limiter is actually another 500 rpm beyond that. Working against just 2570 pounds, it feels 21st century fast, too. The gear shift is perfectly weighted, and despite the switch to carbon ceramic brakes, the middle pedal feels similarly natural in its responses. This love story may have you question our critical faculties, but the car does have some downsides. The first is the price. While considerably short of the seven-figure expenditure required for one of Singer's pixel-perfect offerings, a buyer will still need to pay Theon around $500,000, at current exchange rates, to get something similar to this car, plus the cost of the donor 911. The second is the weight, the company already has a substantial order bank it needs to work its way through and can build at no more than 5 cars a year. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel.
Steve McQueen's bullet movie Mustang suddenly reappeared, this is how it happened. Steve McQueen's Highland Green 1968 Ford Mustang GT Fastback vanished 38 years ago. The ominous-looking pony car with the barking 390 cubic inch V8, which starred in one of the greatest chase scenes in movie history in the film Bullet, with McQueen doing the driving in many of the shots, may have been lost, but it was never forgotten. Certainly not by Mustang aficionados, who speculated on its whereabouts for almost four decades, titillated by the occasional internet post or word of a spectral sighting. So when the Bullet Mustang suddenly appeared at a Ford press preview at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit on January 14, 2018, the assembled journalists, car nuts, Ford execs, and Mustang fans went full geek. The synchronicity of the car's breaking cover in the same year as the Bullet movie's 50th anniversary, and at the same event where Ford revealed its 2019 Mustang Bullet tribute model, the third since 2001, is just too perfect for it to have been happenstance. And yet it largely was. As those involved tell it, the Bullet Mustang never would have resurfaced in Detroit had it not been for a coincidence of cosmic proportions, the sheer luck of fortuitous timing, and, especially, the efforts of a determined coterie of emotionally invested volunteers. It took 30 seconds for the Bullet Mustang, in original, if dilapidated, condition, to rumble onto the stage at Detroit's Cobo Center, but it took a village to make it happen. The Backstory The movie car's trip to the auto show stand actually started in earnest in December 2015, according to its owner, Sean Kiernan. Kiernan, 36, inherited the bullet from his late father. Bob Kiernan had purchased it in 1974 from an ad in our sister publication, Road and Track, to replace the family's only car, an MGB slash GT. You have to remember that, at the time, movie cars were not really sought after, says Kiernan. His father liked the idea that it had been used in a movie, but the big factor was that it handled amazing and had huge amounts of power, especially compared to an MG. The Kiernans initially felt so casual about the Mustang's connection to the film that they employed it as a daily driver. Sean's mother, a schoolteacher, drove it for about five years, at which point it developed clutch trouble. It was parked in 1980, a year before Sean was born. Kiernan grew up to be a car enthusiast like his father, and the two made a couple of attempts at fixing up the old green stain themselves. They got as far as taking the car partly apart and having the engine freshened. The odd thing that happened, says Kiernan, is that the car just stayed in the garage all those years, as a project car does, and the internet was born while she just sat there, and in turn the rumors began to form. Not until 1999 was there any intention of keeping it under lock and key and a secret. My father and I always wanted to reveal it in the right way to squash any rumors that he was a hoarding car collector, and then I was just going to drive it to have fun. But Kiernan's father fell ill and passed away in 2014 before they could get the Mustang reassembled. At that point, says Kiernan, he was feeling the emotional gut punch of his father's death and was in a quandary about what to do with the car. I was struggling, he says. Then came the coincidence that changed everything. In December 2015, Kiernan, a salesman of automotive paint and supplies who lives outside Nashville, was returning from a day of sales calls with his boss, Casey Wallace. Wallace, the company's regional sales manager, had come in from out of town. On the long drive back to the office, Wallace asked Kiernan what cars he had inherited from his father. A 75 Porsche 911 and a 68 Mustang GT390 Fastback, answered Kiernan. Wallace was intrigued and wondered what color the Mustang was. Green, replied Kiernan. Ha, huh, responded Wallace. Sounds like the bullet Mustang. Kiernan recoiled. Was the family secret blown? Kiernan knew Wallace was no car guy. He barely knows how many tires are on his truck. How the hell did he know anything about Bullet? What Kiernan did not know about his boss was that Wallace had a side business. Wallace explained to Kiernan that he and his best friend, independent film and video director Ken Horstman, 
were partners in a film production company called Spyplane Films. They'd been trying to get an action-adventure movie made that Horstman had written several years earlier. It revolved around two 18-year-old friends discovering the bullet Mustang in a barn and what happens after they buy it for a few thousand dollars from the owner, who doesn't know what it once was. Bad guys arrive and separate the kids from the car. Mayhem and car chases ensue. Wallace and Horstman were working on financing their movie venture. Wallace, who lived in Atlanta, was taking advantage of his trip to Nashville to speak with a potential investor while he was there. How close is your car to looking like the bullet Mustang? asked Wallace. Um, damn near exactly like it, Kiernan answered, stunned. What were the chances that a fellow paint salesman who happened to be Kiernan's boss also happened to be in the movie business? And that that same person also happened to be trying to make a film that happened to be about the bullet Mustang that Kiernan happened to own? And then, recalls Kiernan, I had this overwhelming feeling. It was actually the first time I had felt my father's presence since he had passed away. I felt him in the truck with us. And suddenly Kiernan knew what to do. The car you're talking about, he said to Wallace, the one that's been lost forever? It's sitting in my garage. I've got it. I couldn't breathe, recalls Wallace. Once he recovered from Kiernan's revelation, he asked if his filmmaking partner could see the car. The three met the next day and spent hours talking about what they might do together. We made a pact, recalls Horstman. We decided to do three things, to tell Sean's story as a way to honor his father, to reveal the bullet to the world, and to make our movie. It was enough to motivate Kiernan, a hands-on car guy with lots of experience wrenching, to reassemble the bullet and get it running again. Verifying Provenance but how to proceed with their three-pronged plan. The first step was to get the car authenticated. Of course, we knew it was authentic, says Kiernan. He even had a letter from Steve McQueen to his father written in 1977 asking if he could buy the car back. Bob Kiernan turned McQueen down. After some research, Horseman reached out to John Clore through LinkedIn. Clore, a gonzo Mustang nut, is also Ford Performance's enthusiast communications manager, the company's public relations liaison with all of the Mustang clubs scattered across America. That first connection was key. I'm a Mustang enthusiast, says Kiernan, laughing, and I'm also a lurker on all kinds of Mustang forums. I had to be, I never wanted it to be discovered that we had the bullet. John Clore had a big presence on the forums and I'd seen him in the Mustang documentary A Faster Horse. Although Horstman's note was of necessity vague, Clore wasted no time in responding. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Tested, 2022 Volkswagen Taos plays big among subcompact SUVs. The all-new 2022 Volkswagen Taos is the product of a familiar pattern in the car business. As a particular vehicle segment, in this case, crossovers, grows in popularity, manufacturers tend to enlarge and differentiate their entries to make room for new models that fill the newly created gaps in their lineup. With VW's range of SUVs in the United States swelling to include the compact Tiguan, the midsize Atlas and Atlas Cross Sport, and the electric ID.4, sort of an SUV, we guess, a vacancy has opened up in the increasingly popular subcompact space among the likes of the Jeep Compass, Kia Seltos, and Subaru Crosstrek. It also helps that VW won't be offering Americans a regular, non-GTI version of its latest golf hatchback, which we're still sore about. At least the Taos is a compelling little crossover on most fronts. Little is sort of misleading, though, as the Taos is one of the larger players in its class. Its MQB-based architecture rests atop a wheelbase of either 105.6 inches for the all-wheel drive variant or 105.9 inches for the front driver. It has a huge back seat for a subcompact SUV, and its capacious and easily accessible cargo hold can swallow 25 cubic feet of stuff behind the rear seats, 28 cubes if you forego all-wheel drive. 
On the road, if you don't know to look for its distinguishing design cues, a broad LED light bar that connects the standard LED headlights plus chrome touse lettering on the rear lift gate, you can easily mistake it for a, slightly, larger Tiguan. VW says the name Taos refers to the rugged, picturesque town in New Mexico. We didn't go there for our drive, but we did traverse our local Michigan haunts in front drive and all-wheel drive variants, both top SEL trim levels. Powering the Taos is a new 1.5-liter version of the EA211 turbocharged inline-4, a 1.4-liter EA211 is found in the Jetta sedan. Aided by the boost of a variable geometry turbocharger, the engine purrs willingly to its 6,000 RPM redline and produces a respectable, if not quite spirited, 158 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque, the latter from just 1750 RPM. That's less grunt than you'll get from a top-spec 175 horsepower Seltos 1.6T or a 250 horsepower Mazda CX-30 Turbo but it's perfectly adequate for casually merging onto highways. Standard front-wheel drive models pair the Turbo 4 with a conventional 8-speed automatic transmission. All-wheel drive versions get a 7-speed dual-clutch automatic, which VW calls a direct-shift gearbox, DSG. The company says this split allowed it to focus both on greater fuel efficiency with the 8-speed and a sportier driving character with the dual-clutch. The front-wheel drive SEL model we tested ambled to 60 miles per hour in 7.4 seconds and covered the quarter mile in 15.8 seconds at 87 miles per hour, making it slightly quicker than the latest Subaru Crosstrek with a 2.5-liter flat 4 and significantly fleeter than a Jeep Compass. An all-wheel drive SEL for motion example, which at 3,557 pounds was 313 pounds heavier than the front driver, was only a hair slower to 60 miles per hour, hitting that mark in 7.5 seconds. It also posted an identical 15.8 second quarter mile time. The more powerful turbocharged Kia Seltos, however, is roughly a half second quicker than the VWs both to 60 and through the quarter mile. That said, the front-drive Taos is the fuel miser's choice, earning an EPA combined estimate of 31 miles per gallon versus 28 miles per gallon for all-wheel drive models. Our front-drive example fared well in the real world with a 30 miles per gallon average, and it posted an impressive 40 miles per gallon on our 75 miles per hour highway test, beating its federal rating by 4 miles per gallon. The aforementioned Subaru and Kia both AWD, managed only 30 MPG on our highway run, significantly behind the 33 miles per gallon that the all-wheel drive Taos achieved in that test. Overall, the AWD version averaged 29 miles per gallon while in our care. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. The all-new 2023 CRV is everything you want in any terrain. Adventure, a versatile word that covers a lot of ground just like the next-generation CRV, The redesigned midsize SUV is ready for bigger adventures, from cross-down to cross-country, with more capability, a spacious cabin, and plenty of room for gear. The 2023 CRV boasts a rugged new design with a longer wheelbase and wider stance. Its bold front end, which features a large, upright grille and elongated hood, gets attention. Its powerful posture, accentuated by a sporty roofline, brings the rugged look together from end to end. New dual low-beam headlights create a distinctive look and offer more illumination than previous CRV models. Wide-open sightlines come standard, but it's up to you and your crew to seek out those priceless views. With roomy seating and sporty details throughout, the all-new interior of the 2023 CRV makes it perfect for adventure. Feel instantly connected to your surroundings, thanks to a minimalist layout, intuitive steering wheel mounted controls, and body stabilizing front seats. Bigger adventures also need more comforting rest afterwards, so each passenger will appreciate the reclining rear seat on all trims. Adventures don't just happen in the wild. They take place every day near home. Have your hands full with gear or groceries? 
simply kick your foot under the bumper with the available hands-free access power tailgate. The low, wide cargo opening and expanded cargo area makes it easy to load in and out. Know what else an adventure needs? Better tech and fewer wires. The all-new CRV provides both. Wireless Apple CarPlay Registered 1 and Android Auto Trademark 2 compatibility are now standard on EXL and Sport Touring trims. With wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto compatibility, you can connect the touchscreen to your compatible smartphone. A 7-inch touchscreen now comes standard on all CRV trims. You can go even bigger by touching, pinching, and swiping through navigation, your ultimate road trip playlist, or that podcast you can't stop listening to with the available 9-inch touchscreen. No cord? No problem. Simply place your compatible phone on the available wireless phone charger 3 to start powering up. Whatever your soundtrack while exploring in the CRV, hear every note in rich detail with the available Bose Premium Sound System for featuring Centerpoint registered surround sound technology to create a concert like listening experience. The all new CRV also includes a wide range of enhancements to help you feel connected to your drive. Whether you're navigating your morning commute or the road less traveled, every drive has the potential for excitement with a turbocharged 1.5-liter engine kicking out 190 horsepower.5 and, if you're out where roads can become slippery, the available real-time AWD with Intelligent Control System trademark provides smooth handling and peace of mind. Bigger adventures call for more options. The new snow mode gives you added confidence on slippery winter roads, while the available sport mode gives you maximum acceleration response and a healthy dose of thrills. Okay, enough reading. Take the CRV on an adventure already. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. This is the 2021 Nissan Rogue's biggest asset, literally. My time with MT's 2021 Nissan Rogue is coming to a close and there's just enough to like about the SUV to make it a bittersweet ending. When I hand over the keys, I'll miss the Crimson Family Chariot, even if it's far from perfect. Stay tuned for our final verdict coming soon. We recently announced our 2023 SUV of the Year winner, and I couldn't help but think of the Rogue. Two years ago, the 2021 Rogue advanced to the finalist round in the competition. But this year, when the Rogue was invited back thanks to its new 201 horsepower turbocharged i3 engine, it didn't make the finalist cut. It goes to show how quickly the SUV space has advanced and that the updated Rogue didn't quite move the needle enough, especially in the face of strong competitors like the redesigned Honda CRV and various electrics. Nissan still doesn't offer an electrified Rogue, though the Aria fills that gap somewhat. I'm eager to hop into the updated Rogue and try it for myself, but being the used car proponent I am, I'm not convinced I'd spring for the new model over the 2021 version. Although I could use the new Rogue's extra 20 horsepower and its increased low-end grunt, it still suffers from a laggy CVT automatic. Reaching 60 miles per hour takes the same 8.4 seconds as it did in the previous Rogue. Plus, the interior of my 2021 Rogue doesn't feel outdated except for the infotainment system, which isn't as crisp and responsive to Touch's rival offerings. The updated Rogue's infotainment system still fails to impress. For me, the Rogue's biggest asset is its generous interior dimensions, which haven't changed from the 2021 model year. The wide cargo opening makes it easy to load luggage for the whole family. In the passenger quarters, the Rogue can comfortably fit two car seats and a small person in the middle seat without too much trouble. Because the rear doors open wide, entry and exit is effortless, as is loading babies into the SUV. Sufficient headroom front and back enhances the spacious feeling. Despite its roomy interior, the Rogue feels decently nimble and is easy to park. 